This STS University course on aortic root enlargement procedures will have the following objectives. First, we will begin by reviewing aortic valve and left ventricular outflow tract anatomy. An understanding of the nomenclature employed to describe these structures and the geometry of their interaction will allow for a more focused investigation of various surgical techniques for performing aortic root enlargement. We will focus upon posterior enlarging techniques such as the Nix and Manugian procedures as well as anterior enlarging strategies, including the Kono-Restan aortoventriculoplasty, as well as the ross kono aortic valve replacement procedure. Any discussion of root enlargement procedures also requires an understanding of myectomy and myotomy anatomic considerations and techniques for the left ventricular outflow tract. Finally, at the course itself, some other options, including the Bentall-type aortic upsizing procedure, as well as the Mavrudis procedure, will also be discussed and described. An understanding of aortic root anatomy is critical to best describe and differentiate between aortic root enlargement techniques. The aortic root consists of the aortic annulus, aortic cusps, aortic sinuses, and the sinotubular junction. The aortic root represents the outflow tract from the left ventricle. It provides supporting structures for the leaflets of the aortic valve, and it forms a bridge between the left ventricle and ascending aorta. These pictorials represent various anatomic areas of importance involving the aorta, aortic valve, and aortic root. All aortic root enlargement procedures are described based upon an anatomic understanding of the coronary artery ostea, the coronary sinuses and commissures, and special attention paid to the relationship of these structures with the conduction system, the mitral valve and its apparatus, as well as the interventricular septum. In addition, the ability to distinguish the membranous portion of the septum is of critical importance. Several preoperative considerations are critical to a successful surgical intervention regarding aortic root enlargement. It is important to fully evaluate adult patients for coronary artery disease prior to intervention. In particular, a clear understanding of the left anterior descending artery anatomy and the location of the first septal branch is critical especially in operative strategies involving harvesting, and the use of a pulmonary autograph for aortic valve replacement. Careful review of the preoperative echocardiographic evaluation will allow for strategies to be devised to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. Concomitant subaortic stenosis can also be identified to delineate the need for associated myectomy or myotomy interventions. In addition, echocardiographic evaluation can allow for a better recognition of potential post-stenotic ascending aortic dilation as well as a thorough investigation of pulmonary valve architecture for consideration of autographed use. Mitral valve architecture and the degree of potential insufficiency should be noted as this may be altered following aortic roots enlargement. Adult congenital patients in particular who may have history of associated arch anomalies may require a CT or an MRI scan to ensure that these structures and potential anatomic anomalies are well defined. Finally, a resting ECG should be ordered and reviewed to evaluate for any preoperative signs of atrial level dysrhythmia, which may be addressed at time of surgical intervention. The following is a general schematic focusing upon the location of incision for several enlargement strategies. There is an error in this pictorial regarding the right versus left coronary arteries. This slide also illustrates to some extent the difference between anteriorly versus posteriorly directed root enlargement techniques. Posterior enlargement of the aortic root is accomplished by either the Nix or Manugian techniques. The Nix method is a vertical incision through the commissure between the left coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp, extending down into the interleaflet triangle. The Manugian method is a vertical incision through the mid portion of the non-coronary sinus, through the aortic annulus and into the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the roof of the left atrium. Both approaches are arguably the most commonly accepted and widely used techniques for aortic root enlargement and will be a large focus of our wet lab course at the STS. Of paramount importance, regardless of any proposed technique, is exposure of the left ventricular outflow tract. In many instances, a complete division of the ascending aorta, approximately one centimeter above the sinotubular junction, provides excellent exposure to the aortic valve and left ventricular outflow tract. Stay sutures may be placed into the wall of the aorta to help retract tissue and appropriately identify the coronary ostea, native valve architecture, and commissures as well as the subaortic region. 
The Nix procedure is classified as a posterior enlargement technique and again involves an incision down the commissure dividing the left and non-coronary leaflets. Limiting the incision to just the inner leaflet triangle can enlarge the root sufficiently upwards of 2 to 3 millimeters. If a greater enlargement is required, an incision can be carried down further into the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the roof of the left atrium. The following two slides depict the patch reconstruction process following a Nix incision. After the aortic root has been enlarged sufficiently, a diamond-shaped patch material is prepared. One end of this patch material is inserted into the distal end of the enlargement at the level of the aortic mitral continuity, if the incision is only to the inner leaflet triangle. Interrupted sutures with pledgets are preferred as the inner leaflet triangle lacks fiber strength. The sutures may be placed through the sewing ring of the aortic valve prosthesis, with the remainder of the valve sutures being placed through the aortic annulus in standard fashion. If the Nix incision is carried further into the left ventricular outflow tract by crossing into the anterior leaf of the mitral valve and onto the left atrium, reconstruction is initiated by placing the patch into the deepest portion of the incision and in turn reconstructing the defect within the anterior leaflet with patch material. Interrupted sutures without pledgets are suggested for accuracy and strength. At the level of the aortic annulus, the interrupted sutures with pledgets are placed and passed first through the patch and then through the sewing ring of the prosthesis. The remainder of the valve sutures are subsequently placed through the annulus and sewing ring in standard fashion. If the left atrial wall is flexible and the defect is small, the left atrial wall can be approximated directly to the patch. Otherwise, a second patch is fashioned to reconstruct the left atrial defect. The Manugian incision, as previously described, provides the surgeon with another well-accepted posterior enlargement technique. This incision is placed through the mid-portion of the non-coronary sinus. Within the A section of this particular slide, one can appreciate the geometric relationship between where the incision is initiated and the extent of its length through the base of the non-coronary cusp. In addition, the internal depiction of the incision is displayed. The B section of this slide provides a general representation of patch followed by prosthesis placement in regards to reconstruction, which we will describe in greater detail within the next few slides. Following root enlargement by an incision across the non-coronary portion of the aortic annulus into the anterior leaf of the mitral valve and roof of the left atrium, a diamond-shaped patch of pericardial or prosthetic material is cut to appropriate size. As with the Nix procedure, reconstruction is initiated by placing the patch into the deepest portion of the incision and in particular repairing the defect in the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve with the patch using interrupted or continuous sutures without pledgets. At the level of the aortic valve annulus, interrupted sutures with pledgets are placed and passed first through the patch and then through the prosthetic valve. Remaining valve sutures are placed through the aortic annulus in standard fashion. Once again, if the left atrial wall is flexible and the defect is small, it can be approximated directly to the patch material. Otherwise, a second patch is fashioned to reconstruct the left atrial defect. In the anterior enlarging technique of the conorastan aortoventricular plasty, the aortic root is mobilized by careful dissection anteriorly between the right coronary sinus and the pulmonary artery. This dissection is leftward of the right coronary artery and carried down to the level of the aortic annulus. The aortic root is then enlarged by an incision through the right coronary portion of the aortic annulus, near the commissure between the right and left coronary cusps. This incision may be deepened into the interventricular septum, and a matching incision is thus made on the right ventricular free wall to enlarge the right ventricular outflow tract. A diamond-shaped patch of pericardial or prosthetic material is now fashioned and placed deep within the interventricular septal incision. Continuous sutures may be employed to place the patch to the ventricular muscle up to the level of the aortic annulus. Subsequently, a second patch is employed to reconstruct the right ventricular outflow tract. Interrupted sutures with pledges are employed to attach the base of the triangular RVOT patch to the junction of the diamond-shaped LVOT patch at the level of the aortic annulus. Subsequently, the sutures are passed through the sewing ring of the prosthetic valve with the remainder of the valve sutures placed through the annulus in standard fashion, followed by placement into the sewing ring of the prosthesis. 
The right ventricular outflow track patch is now folded over the free wall of the right ventricle and a continuous suture is employed to attach the patch to the ventricular epicardial muscle. The left ventricular outflow track patch is tailored close to the defect and may be done in a fashion to also incorporate closure of the aortotomy. Hypoplasia of the left ventricular outflow tract and concomitant pathology of the aortic valve can be addressed successfully by combining the aortoventriculoplasty with pulmonary autograft replacement of the aortic valve. Harvesting of the pulmonary autograft is accomplished by carefully dissecting the pulmonary artery off the aorta and transecting the pulmonary artery to ensure appropriate anatomic visualization of the pulmonary valve leaflets. A small right angle clamp may be passed well below the pulmonary valve annulus and gently pushed through the right ventricle anteriorly. The right ventricle is then divided well below the annulus with direct visualization of the pulmonary valve leaflets. Sharp dissection of the ventricular septal region is accomplished to separate the pulmonary trunk from the right ventricle and done in a fashion to ensure protection of the first septal branch of the left anterior descending artery. A conal anterior vertical incision is made through the aortic annulus near the commissure between the right and left coronary leaflets as previously described. The incision is carried into the interventricular septum to enlarge the left ventricular outflow tract and the right ventricular muscle portion of the autograft is inserted deep into the LVOT. Interrupted sutures are now employed to attach it to the defect in the interventricular septum. The autograft is then attached to the aortic annulus with interrupted sutures in standard fashion. In instances where preoperative evaluation is also revealed subaortic narrowing or obstruction, con a concomitant myotomy or myectomy in addition to aortic valve replacement may be an option for an anatomic and physiologically adequate left ventricular outflow tract. Exposure is obtained as been previously described by either an aortotomy or by a complete transection of the ascending aorta. The coronary artery ostia are then well defined to avoid any iatrogenic injury. In addition, the valve leaflets, commissures, and area of the presumed conduction system are also well identified and protected during the process of myectomy or myotomy. Optimal visualization of the ventricular septum is facilitated by posterior displacement of the anterior wall of the left ventricle with a sponge or sponge stick. A small suction cannula may also be placed across the aortic annulus to retract the anterior mitral valve leaflet and papillary muscles posteriorly and rightward away from the ventricular septum. The myotomy or myectomy incision is made using an 11 blade scalpel and beginning the incision at the mid-ventricular level and extending upward to within 8 to 10 millimeters of the nadir of the annulus of the right coronary cusp. Any incision made at the base of the ventricular septum, more rightward than the nadir of the right cusp, will injure the membranous septum and conduction tissue with concerns for resultant complete heart block. A second longitudinal incision, parallel to the first incision, is made to be carried up within 8 to 10 millimeters of the aortic annulus at the commissure between the right and left coronary cusps. The area to the left of this incision is the left ventricular free wall. These two incisions are now joined superiorly and a hook may be employed to now allow for better traction of the proposed resected muscle, which can be easily elevated. A deep wedge of septum is now resected beginning at the base of the septum and working toward the midventricle. By carefully understanding preoperative TTE or TEE measurements, care can be taken to leave at least one centimeter of retained septum and to avoid iatrogenic creation of a ventricular septal defect. As with any challenging surgical approach or technique, a mindful strategy regarding pearls and pitfalls should be recognized. Careful preoperative and intraoperative planning is essential to delineate options regarding enlargement techniques, as well as to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. This is defined as a valve with an area that is insufficient relative to the patient's body surface area. It is calculated as the effective valve orifice area divided by the body surface area. 
A value of less than 0.85 is thought to be indicative of patient prosthesis mismatch and is also thought to be associated with LV dysfunction in both the early and late postoperative periods. Due to the extensive surgical reconstruction and associated suture lines, appropriate blood pressure management in the immediate post-procedural time, as well as the potential employment of hemostatic agents, should be carefully considered. A thorough survey of all suture lines, especially those located in the difficult to reach and visualize posterior locations and around the coronary buttons, should be completed prior to administration of protamine and other blood products. The first septal branch of the left anterior descending artery should be meticulously preserved during any proposed pulmonary autograft harvest and subsequently pulmonary homograft implantation. Injury to this vessel can result in significant and at times irreversible left ventricular dysfunction. A careful understanding of the conduction system anatomy is also critical for any root incision being made associated with the described enlargement techniques. Particular attention thus should be made to the area underneath the commissure separating the right and non-coronary leaflets, extending leftward under their right coronary ostia. In addition, attempts to place a rigid valve prosthesis tightly into the small aortic annulus can produce excessive pressure on the conduction system resulting in dysfunction or block. Due to the significant challenges of any future reoperation on the aortic root following any form of enlargement procedure, great care should be taken to ensure appropriate decision making regarding prosthesis selection and preoperative decision making based upon an understanding for a desired long term outcome. Finally, it's worth mention and may lead to further discussion at our course the ability to perform complete root reconstructions and a more dedicated focus on anterior enlargement techniques which appear to be gaining more favor. This is likely associated with concerns regarding the impact of posterior approaches upon the mitral valve and the associated reconstruction. Standard postoperative considerations for patients undergoing any form of aortic root enlargement procedure will require a judicious balance between fluid resuscitation and appropriate inotropic support. The status preoperatively of left ventricular hypertrophy and function in addition to the appearance of the left ventricle on transesophageal echocardiography during the completion of the procedure will allow for a framework to drive decision making. Many of these patients will have evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy and as such, small changes in volume status will have a profound impact upon filling pressures. In addition, the thick ventricular myocardium will likely be sensitive to inotropes and very well may be irritable after intraoperative myocardial ischemia. Efforts should be made to aggressively address any hypertension due both to its impact upon suture line bleeding in the immediate postoperative period, but also upon left ventricular function and cardiac output. In the adult population, placement of an intraortic balloon pump may be advantageous in comparison to escalating inotropic support and aggressive volume resuscitation. A low threshold for concern regarding coronary insufficiency should be adopted. Especially in cases of coronary reimplantation, any anatomic distortion may be exacerbated by an enlarged heart during the postoperative period. Prosthetic valve replacement can also impact osteal anatomy and prove to be responsible for obstruction regarding coronary perfusion. In cases of full root replacement, the option of coronary artery bypass grafting in cases of coronary insufficiency may be entertained. The following references were employed for this STS University course video. In particular, the chapter on aortic root enlargement techniques within the first edition of the Atlas of Cardiac Surgical Techniques provides a very useful resource for the topics and techniques discussed in this presentation. The following references were employed for this STS University course video and will be used within the wet lab portion of our educational experience as well.